It should um, work. Okay, so ready to start button is gone and we are live now. Okay, so now uh, the participants are able to see us. And um, yeah, I welcome you all to this um, session on data visualization. Our first speaker is um, Harriet Mason. She is a first year PhD candidate at uh, the Faculty of Business and Economics at the Monash University. And um, I will keep my words short so that we have more minutes for discussions and presentations. So um, Harriet, please share your screen and the stage is yours. Or maybe let us know if you have um, questions. Okay, so there should be a share screen, a share button on in the left bar of your screen. So besides our webcam um, windows, right below the stop camera button. So the third button from top. Okay, so maybe in favor of time, um, let's then start with Paul Har Har uh, Harrison, um, so that we have some time to figure out this those technical issues. Um, Paul uh, has already a PhD in computer science and works also for Monash University in the bioinformatics uh, department. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to have you here, and uh, please, the stage is yours. Thanks for that introduction, Jonathan. Let me just share my screen. Uh, just a second. So share screen. Uh, just a second. Okay, so, oh, hello everyone. Um, hopefully you can see my screen and hear me okay. Cool. So uh, today I'd like to talk to you about an HTML widget that I've been working on. Um, so I've put a link to these slides in the chat uh, if you want to follow along and like, you can also interact with the widget on the slides on your own computer. Uh, so what this is, is uh, an HTML widget. So uh, most of what it does is happening in JavaScript, uh, but you can invoke it from R, either from R or R Studio, or embedded in an R Markdown document like this. Um, and what it does is, uh, supposing you have a high dimensional data set, uh, it shows uh, different two-dimensional projections of the data. Um, so currently, this is what's called a grand tour of the data. Uh, it's spinning around randomly. Um, eventually, you'll see sort of every possible projection of the data. Um, this also uh, has a guided tour mode. Uh, and that's where we look for some nice, in some sense, uh, projection of the data. In this case, looking for a PCA projection. <coughs> now, something slightly different with the guided tour here compared to previous tour software, it never quite settles down. There's always small motions, and so you're always getting a little bit of extra information um, that you wouldn't in a static display. So uh, this is the Palmer Penguins data set that uh, various talks have mentioned. Um, and so I'm starting with this one and then I'll get on to some single cell data that is closer to my usual day job. Uh, but 
This has various ways to interact with it um, that I'll demonstrate through this talk. So we can, we can highlight particular groups in the data. We can look at particular uh, variables in the data. Or another thing we can do is we can hide a particular group in order to focus on the remaining groups. Uh, and you can see when I hid that group, it's now looking for a good projection of the remaining groups. Uh, if I turn it back on, it, it goes back to looking for a good overall projection. Okay, so what's going on here? Um, so we're looking at projections of the data. Um, there have been various tool software over the years starting with Xgobi, as a desktop application. The Tura package in R provides a lot of uh, sort of the, the machinery for doing this, and then there are various other tool packages in R. Um, now, software in the past has tended to come up with a, like a distinct sequence of projections and then, as a separate step, intercalates between them. The novel thing in Langevin Tour is it uses something called Langevin Dynamics to produce a smooth random path. Uh, and so this is sort of more like a physics engine. Um, so the arm waving version of Langevin Dynamics, I don't really want to show you stochastic differential equations in a talk like this. So we have a, a system and it has a state that is described by a velocity and a position. Um, here the position is going to represent a particular projection matrix. Um, and then that projection matrix is changing based on the velocity. Uh, and then there are various things happening to the velocity. So, so that it follows a random path, there's the noise being injected into the velocity. Um, to stop the velocity going off to infinity, we also have some damping. Uh, and then when we activate the guided tour mode, there'll be forces acting on the velocity based on the position. So to complicate this a little bit further, so we always want to be looking at an orthonormal projection of the data. So that's a constraint on the position in this physics system. Um, so I found something called position-based dynamics that's a, a fairly simple and stable way to maintain a constraint. Um, so what this is doing each frame, we have a velocity update. Uh, and then we do a position update based on the velocity. So far, that's leapfrog integration. Uh, and then we fix up a new position. We, we find the nearest orthonormal projection to that. Um, and then we fix the velocity to be consistent with the fixed position. So that's what's going on under the hood. Uh, and then final Final thing here, the guided tour. Um, previous guided tours have sort of optimized uh, and found like one optimum. This is more like sampling from a distribution. Um, so slightly different from previous guided tours. Um, so we can specify a potential energy and then in the long term, it's, it's sampling from this distribution. Um, it's actually, this Langevin dynamics is a nice, efficient way to sample from a distribution if that is something you happen to want to do. And sort of as a bonus, Langevin dynamics produces like this nice, nice path. So you get samples from a distribution and you get this lovely path to like show an animation or something based on it. Um, and then the way this is used, uh, we take the gradient of the potential energy function negative of that and that's the forces applied to the velocity. 
Um, so in particular, so far what I've implemented with Langevator is a potential energy based on distances between points. Um, effectively, this is sort of a repulsion between points. Uh, it'll look for a way to spread out the points by choosing a particular projection. Um, yeah, the tour package has a few other um, other index functions, so I may at some point be adding further guided tours. Uh, it involves like translating that to JavaScript and working out how to calculate proteins. <clears throat> so anyway, now moving on to an example data set from my line of work. Uh, some single cell RNA sequencing. So this is where we have, uh, after a few steps, counts of RNA molecules from typically thousands of genes in tens of thousands of cells. So we have a big matrix of counts, typically a fairly sparse matrix. And based on this, we can look at gene expression in different types of cells. Uh, this particular example I'm looking at is a PBMC, which is sort of the classic single cell RNA seq. So, this is immune cells from blood, like T cells and B cells and monocytes. Uh, I've processed this with the SARA processing pipeline. There's several different pipelines out there. So, normalizing counts within each cell, log transforming doing something a little clever with zeros, uh, and then finding principal components. Uh, and then typically what everyone does with this sort of data is a, a UMAP layout. So taking principal components, sort of, that's a fairly linear step, and th but then this UMAP layout, it's a very non-linear step. Uh, so it does give a good overview of the data, but then I'm sort of wondering, what is this hiding? Uh, it's sort of a bit too good. So let's have a look at this in Langevator. Uh, this is the uh, grand tour mode. And so what we might do is just sort of sit here and, and watch it spin around and get a sense of the data. Um, when we want to dig a bit further, we can activate one of these guided tour modes. Uh, and it'll, it'll try to find a good layout not quite as good as the UMAP, but these like these small motions where things overlap let you distinguish them. Um, so you can see this is this is quite fuzzy. Um, so that's something the UMAP hid, and then those monocytes are really spread out, which is another thing. Like UMAP arrays deliberately erases. So it's a, it's a bit more of an honest way of looking at the data. This is linear projection. Um, so to see the structure a bit better, what I like to do is a, a bit of a denoising step. Um, so this is based on finding nearest neighbors, uh, and nearest neighbors of nearest neighbors and averaging them all together. Um, hopefully that's still like a fairly linear operation that's not distorting the data too much. Um, and we can see a bit more of the structure a little bit more clearly. So one thing here, the starter set has what's called doublets, where we've accidentally mixed two cells together, uh, and they're sort of between cell types. Uh, and you can you can see that in the Langevator view, even denoised, the, the UMAP sort of hid that. And really, we want to exclude these doublets from further processing. So now I haven't shown you the full data set yet. So there's another half to this data set where cells were exposed to a cytokine. The expression has changed. And so these are unstimulated and then stimulated, getting ready to fight an infection. Um, and from the UMAP layer, like you can guess what's going on, but it's only a guess because the UMAP is a very nonlinear view of the data. <clears throat> Looking at this in Langevator, again with denoising, 
So we've got sort of unstimulated, stimulated. You can see this sort of this parallel, the different cell types sort of seem to have the same, same difference between uh, unstimulated and stimulated. To dig into that a bit further, we could like look at different variables. Uh, we'd eventually see, ah, uh, that seems to be component three. Uh, so this is very max rotated principal components. So these components are somewhat interpretable. Um, so I can drag that component onto the plot and, and now we're looking at that particular component uh, or I could hide that component. Uh, and you can see most of the cell types, they're now overlapping. So the, the only difference was in that component, but then the monocytes are, are doing something a bit different. Um, so we could dig, dig a bit more and might find particular variables to do with the monocytes. Um, so that's, that's sort of my process. Um, start by just letting it spin around and soaking in the structure uh, and then sort of start actively exploring the data set and working out what's going on with it. Um, and even like in that active exploration stage where the projection is fairly lock locked down, it's still going to be having these small motions. Uh, and I think our eyes are pretty good at perceiving that. Um, it, it's quite a natural motion. It's sort of quite enjoyable to look at. Um, and that's constantly providing this sort of small extra channel of information. Uh, in particular, I was interested in single cell RNA-seq and we have some weird sort of processing steps we want, like to do. And it's good to be actually able to see what they're doing and dig into what they're doing. So that's sort of my application. Uh, you may have a different high dimensional data set, different application. Um, and yeah, again, you can use it interactively in R or you can publish it using R Markdown. If you were publishing in the R journal or Distill, you can have some figures with this. Um, other journals, you might have a supplemental file or, or put it on the website. Um, so that's the widget. Thanks for listening. Okay, um, so thank you very much, Paul, for your uh, presentation. I think this package looks really useful and interesting. We have uh, one question from the audience, um, and Tim asks if there is a tutorial on how to use the package on other data sets, um, showing the R code behind uh, your slides. Uh, yes, so... There is a website in Package Down. Um, there's a reference. So, like there's some example code here with the Palmer Penguins, for example. Uh, and then I have also some like vignettes showing uh, using it with various different. Uh, data sets. Um, so there's bits of code there that you could explore. Okay, perfect. Um, so I myself asked me um, how you created those interactive elements in, in R. Did you use some framework like Shiny or... Um... Uh, so, so the trick here is that it's basically all JavaScript. Um, Shiny just wouldn't have the like responsiveness. You, you can't get this sort of instant responsiveness with Shiny. So uh, yeah. with the state of things at the moment, it, yeah, it does have to be all JavaScript, basically. Um, and yeah, I, I used a little bit of D3, but it's mostly vanilla JavaScript. Okay, perfect. Um, so there are uh, a lot more questions um, now in the Q&A section. 
Um, but in the interest of time, and since we already lost some time, I would propose that we continue with our first presentation from Harriet. Um, yeah. So please um, try to share your screen um, or your slides and then um, yeah, start your presentation. And if we have some time left after uh, all the talks, we can start a discussion about those questions. But you are also welcome to uh, answer those questions shortly um, in the Q&A section directly, Paul. OK, so the stage is yours, Harriet. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Harriet Mason, a PhD student at Monash University. It is 4 a.m. here, and I decided to stay up late instead of waking up early, and I now think that was a terrible decision, so we're going to see how this goes. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about scagnostics. Uh, what are scagnostics, you may be thinking? They're a group of measures that evaluate the visual features of a scatter plot. Uh, your next question might be, well, why do we care about them? Uh, well, scatter so, plots. Ma oh. Sorry, um, my question would be, should we see your slides? Because oh. we do not at the moment. <laughs> oh, no. Um, can you still not see them? Me mm. not. Sorry. <laughs> OK, hold on. Let me swap this. What if? Um, Um, can you still not see them? Mm, no. Well, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> um, hmm. Do you have a link to them by any chance? Uh, I'll try and sort one out. Maybe someone else should go again and I'll... Yeah, we, yeah we can yeah. we can continue with this okay. scheme. Um, so then I would propose that um, Sherry is going to um, to present, and I am going to try to share my screen with Harriet's uh, with Sherry's slides. Um, so let's try. How is that doing? Do you see anything? Yeah, you should. OK, so Sherry, um, please <laughs> go on and just tell me when I, I'm supposed to uh, switch to the next um, slide. And we can't hear you, unfortunately. So maybe you have to unmute yourself. Um, oh, yeah. So can you hear me now? OK, perfect. Okay. Um, so we were having some technical issue just before that. Um, Seems that me and Harriet, we both can't share our slides. So um, this is a backup plan. So hopefully it will still work. So um, firstly, thank everyone for coming. And the title of my talk today is Kabul, an R package for organizing and wrangling multivariate spatial temporal data. So you should have access to the link um, if Jonathan would like to share that with the audience. Um, so next slide. Spatial data is a common type of data. And here there are 50, 59 weather stations distributed in New South Wales and Victoria in Australia. The data is organized in SF class and the package SF provides various geometrical operations in a space for this class. So next slide. Temporal data is another common data type. Here, I'm showing you some daily historical temperature data for those 59 stations. On the right, a fraction of the data in year 2020 is plotted. This data is stored in a Sybil class with ID as the key to define each series and date as the index to define the timestamp. The Sybil class allows you to wrangle temporal data and build spatial mo temporal models. So next, next slide. Okay. Um, however, spatial objects and temporal objects do not naturally work well with each other for spatial temporal analysis. Here, let me give you some examples. If I join an SF object with a Sybil object, the Sybil class will get lost. 
So here you see the output. The first class label is SF. In the end, it's TBLDF. So there should be a TBLTS in between. So if we join the data the other way around, the SF class will get lost. So you can see the second output has TBLSF, RTS, but not SF. So next slide. We can manually enforce the join object to have both classes with the function STSSF. But the class label can still get lost during the operation. So next slide, please. The one before. Yep. So here I use the Sybil function, fill gaps. And the result do not have the SF class. So you can see the second output. It has the TBLTS, but not the SF class. So also, if we're taking a step back, the left join approach on the spatial and temporal data is not necessarily the best way to structure spatial temporal data. This is because all the feature geometries are repeated multiple times, especially for long daily data, like the temporal data I just showed you. So this motivates a new data representation. The next one. So today I will introduce a new data structure called Kabul to organize spatial temporal data. And we will see how data wrangling with Kabul can be fun. So conceptually, spatial data, spatial temporal data can be sort of as a data cube. In this cube, there are three axes. There are time, site and variable. The exit site defines the location of the entities and axis variable is used to mo represent multivariate information. We define our data cube slightly different from the conventional cube to avoid introducing hypercubes for multivariate information. Operations on multivariate spatial temporal data can be sort of as slicing and dicing on a cube. Although the data cube is conceptually convenient, for data wrangling, a 3D array structure may not be sufficiently rich, for example, to wrangle special daytime class. Next slide. So now I will demonstrate how Kabul organizes spatial temporal data with two forms. The nested form organizes each side in a row and spatial variables fixed for each side can be directly wrangled. Temporal variables varied across time are nested in a list column called TS. On the other hand, the long form Kabul organizes each row by a combination of sites and dates, similar to a Sybil. Temporal variables can be directly wrangled and spatial variables are stored in a data attribute, which I will show you shortly in the code. Next. In a spatial temporal analysis, we may want to first subset a few locations and then explore their temporal patterns. We may also want to first calculate some spatial temporal features and then investigate its spatial distribution. These analyses would require switch between the nested form and the long form in a couple. The function phase temporal turns a nested couple into a long form. And it can be used to first filter the location on the nested form and then use phase temporal to switch the data into the long form and then make some temporal summary. The inverse of phase temporal is phase spatial, which switches the long form into a nested form. With phase spatial, we can first make some calculation on the temporal side and switch back to the nested form to view its spatial distribution on the map. Next. Now I'm going to show you how to create a couple from the two data set we have. So here you specify the two separate objects in a list with the name spatial and temporal. Then you specify the key and the index as what you would do when creating a Sybil. The chords argument needs to be specified in the order of longitude and latitude. 
this create a couple in the nested form. Next. The header of a couple tells you that this data has 59 stations. It is in the nested form and it is a subclass of SF. The available temporal variables here are shown in the third row of the header and we have date and Tmax. Also, you can see on the rightmost column of this nested couple that each component, each temporal component in the list column is a Sybil. So it's, it shows as a TBLTS. We can pivot this object into the long form with face tempora. Now the object whether long is a long form couple and it is a subclass of Sybil, which you can read from the first row of the header. The third line header now shows the name of the available spatial variables. The spatial variables are stored in a spatial attribute, which you can see through this command. So here it is stored as an SF object. Next. Here is a code example of using the function face spatial on the long form couple. So this will give us the nested couple before making a switch to the long form. So you can see here, um, I have weather back and weather, they're identical. So here is a syntax comparison with and without couple. With couple, you can do some spatial analysis in the nested form and pivot into the long form for some temporal analysis and then pivot it back to the nested form for some additional spatial analysis. Sometimes your spatial analysis include, include extracting some interesting sites. And without Kabul, you will need to first pull out those interesting IDs. So you can see on the first line on the right that are highlighted in um, light yellow. And then you will need to filter the temporal data on these sites. So similar steps will also happen in the temporal analysis and the spatial data needs to be updated. So that's in the second chunk um, on the right. So in Kabul, these updates are automatically handled by the face spatial and face temporal, and there's no manual updates that's needed. Also, back a bit, sorry. Also, the Kabul pipeline chains all the operations together with no intermediate objects created in the workflow. So you can see the couple syntax is much shorter than the right one. Next, yeah. Some analysis use both spatial and temporal variables at the same time. An example of this is making a glyph map. Here, I will first show you a toy example before rolling up to the full picture. A glyph map is a transformation of temporal coordinates into the spatial coordinates. So the temporal information can be visualized on the map. So here I have one weather station on the map and its maximum temperature on each day in January 2020. Next. A glyph map used linear algebra to make this transformation. You can see here the, the line on the bottom right plot does not change, but its coordinates has been changed to the spatial coordinates. In a glyph map, the spatial coordinates are called the major coordinates and spatial co uh, temporal coordinates are called the minor ones. So in the world of ggplot, we need four aesthetics to make a glyph map. And here there are longitude latitude, the major axis, and the date and tmax. Next. So to work with ggplot, all the four variables need to be in the same table. And in Kabul, you can use the function unfold to relocate spatial variables into the long form. Here I have the diagram, the cube, and also the code to demonstrate this function. So this is how the data look like after the unfold. So you can see it on the middle on the right. 
And after this, the data can be piped into a ggplot with four aesthetics needed for GeomGlyph to draw the glyph map. So that's in the bottom right card. Next. So now here is a full example that combines everything I have introduced in this talk to analyze historical temperature data in Australia. We have maximum temperature dated back to the 70s, which allows us to compare the maximum temperature between now and then and also across space. So the diagram here shows each step is needed in this analysis. And the data I have shown you in this talk is a subset from the all the weather stations in Australia, and there are hundreds of them. So the first step here is to narrow it down to those in New South Wales and Victoria. So this is the first step. Then we pivot the data into the long form to select a historical segment from 1971 to 1975 and the recent segment from 2016 to 2020 in step two. In step three, still in the long form, maximum temperature is summarized into monthly average in each period. A quick check on the number of observations reveals that some stations do not have temperature recorded at both groups. So you can see um, the small diagram after step um, three summarize. You can look at the ID, the ID equals four. There's only group two, but not group one. So we re remove them in a nested form in the step four. And in step five and six, we unfold longitude and latitude with temporal variables and makes the glyph map with geom glyph. Next. So this is the code version of the diagram. So functions highlighted in yellow are developed in the couple package. Spatial operations are highlighted in purple and temporal ones are in pink. On the top left of the plot, there's a uh, top left of the plot, there's a more annotated version of the glyph for one specific station called COBA. So Australia has a U-shaped temperature curve. And if you look carefully on the glyph map, um, the inland New South Wales stations has a noticeable higher average maximum temperature in January in recent years. So I was intended to make some highlights and annotation on slides, um, but I can't do it here. But if you look at that um, inset on the top left, you should be able to see in January, recent years has a much higher um, uh, temperature than the historical ones. So you can see this kind of pattern for most of the inland um, stations in New South Wales. So it's the upper um, geons. So next slide. So there are more things couple can do. For example, Kabul can pick up the unmatched entries in from the spatial and temporal input when you're trying to coerce it into a Kabul object. Next. It can merge its two data sources by spatial and temporal similarities. It can handle spatial hierarchical structure of sites. And input data can be of various forms, including a single combined data frame and also net CEF data. Next. So yeah, this wraps up my presentation today. Um, Kabul has already made its way to CREN. Um, there has been some major changes made in the last few months, and we plan to make a CREN update very soon. So um, keep an eye on GitHub and also the um, also my Twitter. So thanks for your time. Um, hopefully you get a link for the slides so you can also look at it um, at your own computer. Um, Okay, had to organize my windows a bit. Um, thank you very much uh, for your interesting talk. Um, there is one question, but in, in favor of time, I would propose that we skip uh, this question and you um, answer this in this Q&A section on the right. And then I will um, give the word to Harriet and um, again, share slides on my screen. Um, which is not a problem at all. I hope you can see those slides um, relatively good. 
and those slides look um, as they are supposed to be. Okay, so the stage is yours. Um, but we can't hear you, so probably you also have to unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> okay, yes. good. Hi everyone, I'm Harriet. I'm a PhD student at Monash University and uh, third time is the charm. Hopefully this one's okay. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about scagnostics. Uh, what are scagnostics, you may be thinking. They're a group of measures that evaluate the visual features of scatter plots. Uh, your next question might be, well, why do we care about them? Uh, well, scatter plots are particularly useful for examining all kinds of associations between variables, uh, but unfortunately, big data has too many variables to plot them all. So what if instead of looking at every pairwise plot, we instead picked out interesting subsets of plots and only looked at those? That is the main idea behind scagnostics. Uh, so in this presentation, I'm going to explain how scagnostics work. Then I'm going to explain the structure of the Cassavary R package that calculates the scagnostics. And finally, I'll show you how you can use the package yourself by going through an example using Australian Football League statistics. Next slide. So let's see how the scagnostics are calculated by looking at this ring-shaped scatter plot. Next. The first thing we do is remove the numbers and just look at the points in relation to each other. From here, we want to make several objects that represents the shape of the scatter plot. Next, oh. uh, the convex hull, which is the shape we would get if we stretched a rubber band around the outside of the ring. Uh, the alpha hull, which is made by kind of outlining the scatter plot shape and the minimum spanning tree, which is made by connecting every point up using as little edges as possible. Uh, with these three objects, we can then define our scagnostics. Next. Uh, so these are the scagnostics that are in the cassowary R package, all of which have been previously defined in scagnostic literature. They are sorted into three groups depending on which graph-based object they use. Those with an asterisk have had have two versions, a calculation that was defined in scagnostic distributions, a paper by Leland Wilson and Graham Wells, as well as a new adjusted version uh, that was created by us to solve some issues with binning that I will get to later. Uh, to understand some of these scagnostics, it helps to see some examples, so let's go through three of them. Next. First up, we have the scagnostic convex. This is a hull-based measure uh, that is the ratio between the alpha hull and the convex hull. Next. Second is outlying. This is an example of a measure that uses the minimum spanning tree. First, it identifies the outlying points and the length of their edges, and then it calculates how much of the total MST length is due to these outlying edges. Next. And finally, we have splines. This is an example of an association measure. So it takes in the raw data. Uh, it calculates two splines models, one's, one with x as the dependent variable and one with y as the dependent variable. If either of these splines models have a really low variance in their residuals, the spline diagnostic will be high. Next. There are a couple of rules for scagnostics. They aren't just a free for all. Uh, so as well as defining several scagnostics, the scagnostics distribution paper I mentioned earlier also specified three main rules these measures must follow. First, they should all be on a uniform scale so they are directly comparable. Second, each scagnostic should order a set of scatter plots in a way that lines up with human intuition. And finally, the scagnostic should be mostly uncorrelated. If two measures have high correlation, they're probably identifying a similar visual structure, and we could do without one of the scagnostics. Of course, these are not all 100% achievable, but these assessments should be kept in mind when adjusting and creating scagnostics. Next. If you want to calculate these scagnostics yourself, you can do it very easily with the Cassowary R package. Uh, the name is also an acronym. It stands for Calculating Scagnostics on Scatterplots over Wads of Associated Real Numbers, Zs, and R. 
Um, I know what you're thinking, and no, we definitely didn't come up with the acronym after the name. So, <laughs> uh, next. Uh, the package has been written so you can easily incorporate calculating diagnostics into a tidy data workflow. The summary functions are how most people will use the cassowary package. Uh, there are two main diagnostic summary functions, one for long data and one for wide data. There are also two further summary functions of that diagnostic summary, one that finds the highest scatter plot for each diagnostic and another that finds the highest scoring diagnostic for each scatter plot. Uh, the use of these will be shown in the example, so don't get too worried about the explanation being a bit wordy. Uh, the draw functions are mostly a debugging tool. They're designed to help you see the graph-based objects so you can better understand the output of the package. Cassowary R also comes with some data that you can use to test the diagnostics, the most important of which is the features data set. Uh, next. Uh, the features data set is a set of scatter plots, each with a distinct feature that we want to identify. For example, the ring is a hollow version of the disk. It's a bit hard to read <laughs> the slides at all. Um, and we want the scagnostics to be able to identify the difference between them. Next. So as an example of calculating the scagnostics on the features data set, because the features data set is a long data set, we use root by with the calc scavs function to get a scagnostic summary of the data set. The scagnostic summary can be quite large, so this is just a glimpse of what you would usually get. Next. Taking the full scagnostic summary, we can make a visual table and have a look at what each scagnostic sees. On the x axis is the scagnostic value, and on the y axis is the scagnostics. Uh, the points are scattered plots from the features data. Each scagnostic has an example of a low value, a high value, and a moderate value, if it fits. Uh, if you're paying close attention, but again, hard to see, you may have noticed that the scagnostics based on the MST are the ones that are most frequently only have two plots. This is because the distributions are very condensed. This occurs because all of the previous work in Scagnostics had binning as a pre-processing step, and we wanted binning to be optional in the Casper R package. Uh, when we removed binning, though, it allowed for infinitely small edges in the minimum spanning tree, um, and it warped a few of the Scagnostics that calculate some of those ratios. And so to fix this, we have designed a couple of adjusted Scagnostics, uh, one of which is the Clumpy. Uh, next. So here is the same visual table, but we are only plotting Clumpy with Clumpy 2. Uh, and uh, where Clumpy 2 is an adjusted measure that doesn't require binning. You can see Clumpy 2 does a better job of identifying the clusters plot as it appears relatively higher on the measure and is also more uniform from 0 to 1. The measure is still being adjusted as it is quite slow, but even in its current state, it performs better than the original measure without binning. Next. So while it is nice to know that the scagnostics work uh, correctly ordering scatter plots is not what they are used for. The measures need to be able to pick out interesting scatter plots from a large selection of scatter plots. In order to do so, the, uh, in order to do, in order to show that they do this, I'm going to use an example from the uh, Australian Football League Women's 2020 season. The data set is large, it has more pairs of variables than we could plot ourselves, and hopefully the diagnostics will be able to pick out some interesting pairs of variables. Next. So we fetch the data using the Fitzroy package, um, and we want to make sure that we are only using numerical variables, since diagnostics only work on numeric variables. Uh, then we use the calc scags wide function to calculate every diagnostic on every possible pair of variables. This can be a, one can be a bit computationally heavy, so if you do this yourself, you might want to leave it for a minute. Uh, and once you have this data, the best way to analyze it is to look at a splum of this diagnostics next. Uh, unfortunately, a splum of all the diagnostics won't fit on the side, so for this example, I've made it with just a subset. Uh, this is an interactive plot, by the way. Uh, the best way to find interesting scatter plots is 
to kind of like hover around and find ones that are really far away from just the clump of all of the other scatter plots. Uh, those are outlying scatter plots and they're the ones that are of main interest to us. Next. Okay, so this one's a little bit of fun. Uh, we ran the scagnostics on the data and it tells us how interesting each scatter plot is. Uh, five of these scatter plots had a high value or a strange combination on one or more of the 11 scagnostics. Uh, one of them were just two variables I plotted against each other, not really knowing what they looked like. <laughs> so I'll give you guys 10 seconds to think about it and um, come up with an answer on what you think was the one I picked randomly before I change the slide. Oh, uh, it was plot six. <laughs> I picked two very. I picked the two variables that were the easiest to spell. Um, here is plot six alongside two other plots that were also just chosen randomly. These plots don't have structure that is that interesting, and it's not as interesting as the plots chosen with scagnostics. I will show you how a couple of the other plots were selected next. So plot one was really high on outlying and skewed. Um, this means that even after the dot, we removed the outliers, the data was still really spread out. Uh, and this structure is clearly visible in the scatter plot. And we can use the interactive tool to see which players might have been the outliers that were driving the strange shape of this plot. Uh, next. This plot is really high on the association measures. So usually a plot that deviates from that big mass in the middle and it kind of maybe goes to the bottom corner or the top corner will have a nonlinear relationship. We don't have that here. Uh, so possessions and disposals just have a really strong linear relationship. Next. This is the last plot we'll look at and it is my favorite. It was identified because it was high on striated just uh, striated two and low on outlying. This plot clearly shows that almost no players do both bounces and hitouts. Hitouts are when you punch a ball when the ref throws it back into play, and it's usually done by tall players. Bounces have to be done by, while running, so they are usually only done by fast players. In AFL, these two categories seem to have no overlap. Tall and fast are mutually exclusive in this sport. This is a fun example of what we can learn from our data when we use diagnostics. Next. The Cassowary R package also has two functions that summarize the scagnostic information. They are top scags and top pairs. The top scags function gives the top scagnostics for each scatter plot, and this is just a quick glimpse of what it will put out. The actual uh, top pairs data is like 500 rows long, so it's not all going to be on <laughs> slide. Next. Since the scagnostics are supposed to be directly comparable um, on a scale of zero to one, if one scagnostic appears a lot, it is likely identifying some underlying, underlying structure that is present in the whole data set. So we would probably say that this data set has a tendency to be quite skinny and stringy, which means we have a lot of uh, minimum spanning trees that just kind of connected one point to the next in a like line kind of situation. Uh, next. Top scags uh, gives you the scatter plot that has the highest value on that scatter plot for each scagnostic. A recurring scatter plot uh, that is high on a lot of measures is likely a scatter plot with an interesting structure. And this is how, I mean, you can see some of those plots appeared um, in the plot that I talked about earlier. Next. Of all the methods I have just been through so far are how you will typically use uh, Scagnostics as an exploratory data method. This is an example of a guided tour using the convex Scagnostic as a projection pursuit index. Uh, you can play the tour. <laughs> so the data has the feature L-shape the, from the features data set on the X1 and the X4 pi plot and noise on all the other variables. Uh, the use for the scagnostics as a projection pursuit index with the tour package is not in the cassowary R package. 
And some of the measures are not well suited to be used as projection pursuit indexes, either due to being too slow or too noisy. Uh, but this is an area of, of future development for Skagnostics. And you can see from the tour and the slides that it actually does quite a good job of finding uh, the underlying shape given the right optimization parameters. Uh, next. So you may be thinking to yourself, wow, this is a neat package. Is this on Crane? And the answer to that is no. <laughs> we were originally rejected because we depended on Trifac and Alpha Hull, which both had an ACM license. And even though these two packages are on Crane, since they want to transition to only FOSS packages, we were rejected. Then a couple months ago, Alpha Hull was updated despite still being on an ACM license. So we applied for Crane again and said, hey, we have an ACM license for the same reason Alpha Hull does, which is why we, which is that we both depend on TriPack. And Cran said, if you need TriPack so bad, why don't you replace it? And so then we decided to make a FOSS package to replace TriPack. Unfortunately, it seems that Alpha Hull, uh, the Alpha Hull people were doing the same thing. And a couple of weeks ago, they released Interp, which is a FOSS open source version of TriPack. Um, a few, and they updated Alpha Hull to be aligned with that a few days ago, which broke my package and also put all the work we'd been doing on the FOSS version of Tribeck to nothing, which was fun. Um, so now I have to swap all the code over to Interp and it's been a fun week. Uh, next. So what's new for Cassowary R? Um, until I literally had to stop to give this talk, I was debugging the issues with the alpha hull update. So having the package work again is in the very near future. And then after that, I'll re-enter the hellish landscape that is trying to get a package on Cran. Uh, a version two of the package will probably have a faster calculate, have faster calculations, especially for the clumpy skagnostic. And also try to introduce hexagonal binning so the original skagnostics aren't essentially useless. I also want to continue to test the skagnostics as a projection pursuit index, and maybe also have those easy to implement in another package. I've already started doing that, but finishing it up always seems to be off in the distance. Uh, thank you for listening. Here are the links if you want to have some fun with Skagnostics yourself. And that's it for me. Yeah, so Harriet, uh, thank you very much for your interesting presentation and those interesting uh, insights on getting packages on CRAN, um, which I experienced myself can be a bit tricky um, and take some time and debugging. But in the end, I think um, you, you are on a good way. Um, Okay, so in favor of time, I will uh, give it up to Stephanie. Um, she is able to share her screens herself, and um, she is the only uh, presenter coming from industry and not from Monash University. Um, so we have a little bit of excursion here. So stage is yours. Thank you for the introduction, Jonathan. Um, so today my presentation is on Data X-Ray, um, which is a package for interactive table interface for data summaries. Um, this presentation was put together with one of my co-collaborators, Augustine, and we are both at Row. Okay, so I'm pretty sure that I don't really have to convince anyone listening here today as to why it's important to review data both while it's being collected or prior to analysis. Um, but I'm going to walk through a few examples of why we review data and what we're looking for uh, when we do that. Um, so the first example is outliers. So any data points outside of the expected distribution. Um, and we have an example here. Text looks a little hard to read. Um, so what we're displaying is the sodium content in one cup of US cereal. Um, and we can see that majority of the data falls in the 100 to 400 milligram range. And then we have a few um, special cereals, one with about 800 milligrams of sodium um, in the range. And so in the case of outliers, we may want to investigate further or handle the data in a different way um, when that is present. Um, the second example I have is erroneous data. Um, so my colleague on this project has a famous saying, um, maybe, maybe quasi-famous, um, which is that there's one thing that is outliers, and then there is another thing that is called outright liars. Um, and so we have an example of that here. 
um, is a histogram of height in meters. Um, and we can see that the majority of this population is somewhere between one and three meters. Um, and then we have one subject with a height of 11 meters. Um, and so if anyone else here is stuck in the imperial, minds, uh, imperial system mindset, like myself, that's 36 feet. Um, so maybe something else is going on here um, for this particular data point. Um, another reason that we review data is to look for unexpected covariates. So I have an example here from one of my own projects. Um, here we're looking at transepidermal water loss. So it's a function of skin barrier measurement. Um, and this measurement was collected at several different clinical sites. Um, and what we can kind of see from this data is that site X is a bit higher than the other sites where we're collecting this data. Um, and it turns out this is explainable. It has to do with the elevation of site X, but you know, this is an example of somewhere where we might wanna take into account um, other functions of the data for analysis. Um, and lastly, just to generally review the completeness of data um, for a variety of reasons. Um, so here I have an example from the NHANES data set. We're collecting a variable about diabetes. The answers are yes and no. And what you can see is that there is a handful of missing data. Um, and that might be fine, or maybe that's something that has to you know, be investigated further. Um, so these examples are just a select few. There are many more reasons to look at data, um, but the point here just being it's great to look. And so I've been using a tool for several years now um, out of Frank Harrell's HMISC package, um, and that is the describe function. Um, and today I'm using as an example the trial data set from the GT summary package. Um, this data set contains baseline characteristics, as well as the response to treatment after two different chemotherapy agents. Um, and so what we see here is the output of the describe function. Um, there's a lot of information. We have one row per variable. Um, there are summary statistics provided dependent on the variable class, um, as well as a histogram of values. Um, so for example, here we have age. The variable label, which is age, is printed. We can see um, mean as well as some quantiles, minimums, and maximums, um, which makes sense as this is a continuous variable. Um, and then, of course, the histogram um, versus a categorical data, um, which, for example, we see here stage. Uh, now we see a frequency table. Um, so this is a great tool, and it allows us to both generally understand the contents of a data set as well as check for any unexpected values. My slides won't advance. So the goal of um, the data x-ray package is to take all the existing benefits of HMIS Describe and to add a few additional tools to provide a more modern framework for summarizing data. Um, and to do that, we relied on three packages. Um, so the first of those is Plotly. I think we saw a bit of Plotly today. It allows us to swiftly create interactive data displays. Um, the second package is Reactable. Um, which allows us to make interactive data tables with functionality such as sorting, filtering, and grouping. Um, and reactable objects will work seamlessly with our markdown documents, shiny applications, et cetera. Um, and lastly, we also relied a bit on Crosstalk. Um, Crosstalk is an add-on to HTML widgets package. It allows for cross-widget interactions as well as data filtering. So moving on to data x-ray itself, I'm gonna show you a few examples. Um, data x-ray is fairly straightforward to use, um, and I'm gonna go over two different ways to output a summary of the data depending on your use. Uh, the first of those ways is to um, make a reactable object that will contain all of the summary statistics. You can then take that reactable object and put it wherever um, you want. You can you know, put it in a markdown, put it in a shiny, et cetera. 
Um, so to do that, we simply take our data here. Again, we're using the GT summary trial data set and pipe that to make X-ray. Make X-ray will create a tibble that contains all of the variable metadata. Um, and then we can pipe that tibble to view X-ray. Um, and view X-ray turns that tibble into a reactable display. So we can see that now here below. We have our reactable. Um, you'll see this is uh, quite similar to the HMIS describe output. We have one variable per row, the variable label, um, the amount of missingness, the number of distinct. Um, we still have a histogram, but now we have some added interactivity thanks to Plotly. Um, and then additional descriptive statistics are now nested in the reactable. So for example, for treatment here, we can drop down and we see a very similar frequency table um, whereas for age, we drop down and see the appropriate statistics for a numerical value. And then there is a second way in which you can deploy data x-ray, and that's using the report x-ray um, function. And so here, um, we use a markdown template to produce a data x-ray reactable, as well as adding on some additional filtering. So again, we simply pipe the data, the trial data set into report x-ray function now, um, and we supply a data name and what we call a study name. It doesn't really have to be a study. Um, and so I'll show you what that looks like. I'm getting a lot of messages. Am I missing anything? Okay. Um, so here we have the same reactable object that I just showed, but now we've wrapped it inside of a flex dashboard. Um, and then we have additional filters that have been created using crosstalk. Um, so for example, if we want to look only at character value variables, we can select care. And now here we see only the character variables. Um, another useful function here, which doesn't really apply to this example, would be um, filtering your data so that you look at what variables have a high amount of missingness. I'm not going to get into too much detail here, um, but we basically just have a table of all the different metrics that can be found um, in the package. Uh, so we have, you know, a lot that I've already mentioned, means and mins and max, um, and just a description of what each of those are and where you can find them. So I just wanted to lastly showcase one additional feature that is quite useful when working with data sets that are in a long format. Um, so for anyone here that might be a fellow Atom user, um, data sets that are in a BDS structure lean well to this option. Um, so for this example, I'm using an ADLB data set from the Fuse CDIS test data set factory. Um, so again, we call report x-ray, um, but this time we simply provide um, param to this by statement. And what you get is, again, very similar, but now um, your entire reactable is nested by that param value. Um, so for example, if we want to specifically look at glucose, um, we now have all of the summary information but only for the rows in which the param was equal to glucose. Um, so this can be quite helpful. For example, if you wanna look at a distribution of your values of glucose, um, as opposed to looking at the values of the entire data set together, which may be less informative. Um, so one, one function I find quite useful is that you could, for example, select aval and expand across all of the levels of param. And now we have the summary statistics for each level of param in the data set. Um, so there are, of course, other ways that the group by could be applied. Um, if you wanted to review a data set by treatment arm or by sex, or of course, there's just many different applications. 
Um, so we do plan to submit this package to CRAN um, soon. So be on the lookout for that in the next couple of months. But in the meantime, um, the dev version is available um, on Augustine's GitHub, which I've listed here, and um, it's all ready for use. Um, and lastly, I do have just a couple of quick acknowledgements. Um, of course, the backbone of this project is really the HMIS describe function. Um, so we're very appreciative of all the work that was already done um, in that function. Um, and secondly, I have a couple of collaborators on this project, Augustine and Becca. Um, it's always fun to build our tools, but it's much more fun with awesome teammates. Um, so thanks to both of them. And that wraps it up. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, if you wondered why we turned off our cameras, some of the participants uh, had problems with seeing your slides big enough, um, but someone has posted a link to your slides in the chat, so everyone has the slides now. Um, yeah, so um, thank you all very much. We have um, not much time left, so I would propose that uh, um, you are going to have a look at the Q&A section again um, and answer those uh, questions in text form. And um, yeah, I am going to, to close the session now. Um, thanks to you all again and uh, to the participants, if you have um, questions left, just uh, reach out to the presenters and you can uh, reach them via this um, uh, Excel events platform. Okay, so I wish you a nice day uh, or good sleep for Harriet. <laughs> um, yeah, and enjoy the rest of you's R.